On this edition of Jerusalem Dateline, Benjamin Netanyahu makes a stunning comeback after Israel's latest election, his next steps as he becomes prime minister once again. Plus, a disturbing warning from Saudi Arabia. Is Iran getting ready to strike the kingdom? And we'll visit an archaeological discovery from the time of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. All this and more on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. The results are in. Benjamin Netanyahu will return as Israel's prime minister after his Likud party won big in the country's latest election. It's a decisive victory for Netanyahu, who was removed from power last year by a coalition of parties from the right, center, left, and an Arab party. The final count shows that Netanyahu's religious right-wing bloc won 64 seats in Israel's 120-seat parliament. Netanyahu thanked Israelis for choosing him as their leader once again, saying, quote, Together we brought a huge victory for the state of Israel. A big thank you from the bottom of my heart. Outgoing Prime Minister Yair Lapid congratulated Netanyahu on his win and instructed his office to prepare for the peaceful transition of power. I recently joined Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl and CBN News political analyst John Wagi to discuss what this election results mean for Israel. John, Julie, here we are once again. Several days ago, we didn't know what was going to happen, but Netanyahu has won a decisive victory, and now he wants to form a coalition government within two weeks. John, that's lightning speed, isn't it? It's lightning speed, and it's miles different from what we saw the last four elections. I mean, it's, it's all, you have a concession speech or a concession call from the Prime Minister, Yair Lapid, that wrapped up within two days of the election, and now you've got Netanyahu actively engaging in talks with only three other parties, basically, in his uh, coalition. So yeah, That's very unusual, isn't it? Just four parties in a coalition government? Yeah, absolutely. And, mm -hmm. and uh, Netanyahu is the leftward most of those four parties. Yeah, three religious parties, yeah. Mm -hmm. Julie, several days ago on election day, you were talking to Israeli voters. One of the themes they had was that they want uh, a stable government. After five elections within four years, did they get it? I think they have. At least, I think we could be set for at least a couple of years, maybe not four years, but um, since 1988, we haven't had a government that stayed its full four-year mm -hmm. term. But, um, yeah, I think for many, they'll be, they'll, they'll be very, very happy about it. And others may be like, okay, it's stable, but this isn't quite what we had in mind. You mm -hmm. know, more wanted, others wanted the Yair Lapid, but yeah. they didn't get it. <laughs> now, John, is this going to change relations with the United States? You could argue that the Lapid government, Lapid Bennett government, really wanted to walk sort of in lockstep with the U.S. government. Is this going to change U.S.-Israel relations? Uh, I think it will, although, you know, the U.S. has been making, sending the right signals, uh, having the ambassador congratulate Netanyahu, right. saying he wants to work with him. Uh, I don't think they do want to work with him, but I think Netanyahu has a vision that spans what the U.S. has currently been trying to accomplish. And if he is able to negotiate peace with Saudi Arabia, which would be amazing, mm -hmm. and add three or four other Arab nations to an accord, it's possible that he can transcend what the administration's trying to do in Washington. Also, there's a very, fairly strong possibility that Biden will be hamstrung by a Republican Senate and a Republican House mm -hmm. before too long. We'll have to wait and see what happens yeah. after the U.S. elections next week. Yeah. Uh, Julie, based on the results, do you think Israelis got what they wanted out of this election? Um, yeah, I, I think, you know, they're, they're moving in that direction. They're, they think, you know, this could, it will give more stability. Mm -hmm. uh, many people said, or at least what some of the parties ran on on the right was like, you know, this is for a Jewish state because people want more of a Jewish state. And I don't, I don't know that, that everybody has the same definition of what that is. You know, they would prefer things to be completely closed on the Sabbath. Uh, they would, you know, uh, many things, mm -hmm. but uh, especially changing of the, the law of return for Aliyah, for right. immigrating to Israel. I don't know if those things are going to happen, and I'm not sure that the majority of Israelis want that to happen. But I think, you know, I think maybe to a certain extent people can breathe a sigh of relief, you know, in, in terms of um, security and things like mm -hmm. that. I think, you know, Netanyahu will, will do a pretty good job. They know what to expect. Yeah. And we'll just see how things 
shape up. <laughs> Security was a big uh, issue big for a issue. lot of Israelis. John, we talked before the election about praying for the election. Now that the election is over, the results are in. How should people be praying for Israel? Well, you know, we were mentioning the security situation, and I think uh, with rockets coming in from Gaza last mm -hmm. night uh, and ongoing, that's something to pray about is the peace and security of, uh, of, of Israel and the territories. Not everyone was happy about the results, but we need to pray that, that there will be some amicable uh, agreement mm -hmm. that will stop the, the, the ongoing fire. Yeah, yeah. And as Osama said, it's always, you know, be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And as the book of Timothy said, you know, pray for leaders that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life. So uh, I think that's an exhortation for all of us to be praying that way for Israel. So John and Julie, thanks for joining us. And uh, we've been <laughs> through this election and we'll be continuing to cover how the coalition gets put together. While Netanyahu has won this year's election, his next step is to form a government coalition before he's officially sworn in as prime minister. And according to Israeli media reports, Netanyahu is already working to build a new coalition. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl looks at who his partners will likely be. The main possibilities to join Netanyahu would be the Religious Zionist Party, as well as the ultra-Orthodox United Torah Judaism and Shas parties. I think Israel is uh, supposed to be uh, democratic and Jewish. In, uh, I, I don't accept the separation. I think that Israel, if Israel re will be more Jewish, it will be more democratic, and it will be more democratic, it will be more Jewish, because the public in Israel is very strong in its Judaism. Knesset and religious Zionist party member Simcha Rothman has seen an upsurge in support during this round. Many supporters come from communities in Judea and Samaria that have been sidelined by the current largely secular government and recently attacked by terrorists. Israel is a very conservative society politically, in the way of life, in the culture, in the family. The second Israel will be able to decide its faith democratically, you will see the people choose more Jewish values because that's what the people in Israel wants. Jews of American and European descent primarily make up the UTJ party. The main two goals, first of all, to promote the interest of the ultra-Orthodox society, to support it financially, to give, for example, exemption from the army for the ultra-Orthodox man, the ability to study Torah, the support for the institute, the education system. According to Gilad Malach of the Israel Democracy Institute, the party wants a stricter version of Judaism within society. And the second thing is they want to promote keeping Shabbat as a day that there is no market, no transportation, to be more strict regarding conversion issues to Judaism and other religious issues. Shas party supporters are very diverse. The voters of the Shas party comes from all over. We have votes from the Arab villages. We have votes from downtown Tel Aviv. We have votes from Jerusalem. We have across the country. Because people understand for a stable future for the kids, they need to vote for Shas. Because no matter who you vote, you need to bring the following day bread to your table. While the Religious Zionist Party and UTJ push for a more strict definition of who is considered a Jew and therefore allowed to immigrate to Israel, the Shas founder had a broader view. Rabbi Yavad Yosef was the only chief rabbi of Israel that recognized the Jewish people from Ethiopia as Jewish. Uh, it's known that people from Russia get recognition straight away that you're Jewish. They also support the peace process. Shas party is the only religious party that joined the Rabin government in 1992. And we want peace, we're running for peace. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Last month, the UN's Commission of Inquiry released a new report saying that Israel's control of East Jerusalem and parts of Judea and Samaria are unlawful. The report made no mention of Hamas, its terrorism, and its refusal to acknowledge Israel's right to exist. As the report was about to be presented to the General Assembly, the organization Stand With Us gave a vigorous response. Rather than burning the Jew at the state, anti-Semites burned the Jewish state at the state. And this is exactly what the institution behind us constantly does. I'm honored to be here today representing tens of millions of Christians in America and hundreds of millions of Christians around the world who stand firmly and resolutely alongside Israel and the Jewish people. 
The U.S. has condemned the findings of the commission, as have governments of Canada, the U.K., Germany, and other democracies. Coming up, new intelligence from Saudi Arabia reveals dangerous moves Iran might be about to take. Saudi Arabia has shared intelligence with U.S. officials suggesting that Iran may be planning an imminent attack on the kingdom, a move that threatens to escalate tensions between the two Mideast rivals. The Pentagon says Washington is ready to defend its partners in the region. We are concerned about the threat picture. We, we are in constant contact uh, through uh, military, diplomatic, intelligence channels uh, with the Saudis, uh, and we won't hesitate to act in defense of our interests and our partners in the region. The U.S. also believes Iran is preparing to supply Russia with advanced surface-to-surface -surface missiles for its war in Ukraine, a claim Iran denies. The Biden administration says it's no longer focused on reviving a nuclear deal with Iran due to its involvement in Ukraine and the brutal crackdown of protests over the death of a young woman in police custody. Instead, Biden officials say the U.S. is focused on imposing more sanctions on Iran to deal with the regime. I spoke with CBN News contributor Ellie Cohenim about the state of the nuclear talks and the latest from Tehran. Here's what she had to say. Ellie Cohenim, thanks for joining us on Jerusalem Dateline. There's been intelligence about Saudi Arabia concerned about an attack from Iran. What are your thoughts about that? It makes perfect sense. The Iranian regime right now is probably at its weakest point in its history since taking over in 1978. And they have been blaming the so-called Zionist Israel and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the unrest uh, domestically, which is ridiculous. Uh, obviously, the regime's human rights abuses are the cause of the unrest in the country. But they've been trying to blame the unrest on the Saudis and on Israel. And so it would make sense that the regime would try to target the the Saudis in some form of retaliation as they see it. And Iran is spreading. It's not only in the Middle East, but it's getting involved in uh, in the Ukrainian war. And talk about maybe uh, providing surface to surface missiles to Russia. Is that happening? The White House confirmed about two weeks ago now that uh, that over the summer there were sales of Iranian kamikaze drones to Putin. And so the latest news is that the IRGC, the Iranian forces, are actually boots on the ground in Crimea. They seem to be training Russian forces on the use of their drone technology. Uh, most likely, they are observing how that technology is working out in the field, and they're there for maintenance and other purposes. So, Chris, what uh, I believe should be very worrying for the Europeans is understanding that the terror and havoc that the Islamic Republic has been wreaking for over 43 years in the Middle East, North Africa region is now come to Europe. And uh, if there was no other reason for the Europeans to set back the Islamic Republic, now they need to understand that the Islamic Republic has come to their soil. And certainly I hope it becomes motivation if there were no other motivation for them to, uh, to take a couple of steps. They should be recalling their own ambassadors from Iran and they should be expelling the Islamic Republic's so-called diplomats from their soil. Yeah. Uh, Robert Malley has been making some comments recently about the negotiations, nuclear negotiations with Iran. Where do they stand right now? We saw the Islamic Republic's uh, spokespeople saying that they were sending personnel back to Vienna to restart the Vienna talks, while at the same time, the Biden administration and the Iran envoy Rob Malley has made statements to the effect that the U.S. is not interested. Um, he seemed, however, to be saying that it was because the Islamic Republic's demands were unreasonable, which would seem to imply that the Biden administration would be willing to uh, further the talks if the Islamic Republic's demands were what they consider more reasonable. Now, I'll tell you, this is a shocking, uh, shocking development for us because, number one, we know that there is not a lot of American support for the Biden administration to re-enter the disastrous Iran deal. And there is a belief that the administration has been holding off on re-entering the deal until we get through the midterm elections, understanding how unpopular, even in the Democratic Party, it would be for the Biden administration to try to re-enter the Iran deal. So if Rob Malley's statement is simply that he's waiting for a better offer from the other side, 
I believe he's going to receive a lot of pushback from the American people, especially as the Iranian people are still demonstrating on the streets and unfortunately being killed by the regime for doing so. Final question, uh, Ellie. Tell us what is happening on the streets of Iran right now. We are seeing the, the regime take more brutal and violent tactics against the Iranian people. Over the weekend, there was a concerted, uh, coordinated effort by the regime to hit university students all across the country. And Chris, the bravery of the Iranian people is awe-inspiring. They are still out there in the streets. We, Even though there are internet blockages, we still are seeing video footage on social media that people from Iran are sending out, showing us that the people are still out there. They are demonstrating in the thousands. Again, despite very horrible footage that we're seeing of, of protesters being beaten, murdered, hit by uh, regime forces, cars, they're driving over people and shooting them and beating them. It's the most horrible footage, heartbreaking stuff to see. And at the same time, the Iranian people's courage is something to not, it's, it, it's just truly awe-inspiring, hard to believe how courageous these people can be. Well, Ellie, I would agree, are inspiring. And uh, and despite the fact that they are really uh, outnumbered by uh, by the Islamic regime, and we'll see what happens. We'll be praying for what's happening in there in Iran. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Up next, archaeologists reveal a hidden ancient treasure in the Garden of Gethsemane. Archaeologists in Jerusalem have uncovered evidence that a site long believed to be the Garden of Gethsemane actually does date back to the time of Jesus. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl tells us more. The Garden of Gethsemane, marked by the Church of All Nations, has been revered for generations as the place where Jesus prayed on the night he was betrayed before his crucifixion. The church behind me was built at the foot of the Mount of Olives between 1919 and 1924. When the foundations were laid, remains of the Byzantine and Crusader periods were discovered, but nothing from the Second Temple times when Jesus would have been there. 2,000 years ago, it was a field outside the walls of Jerusalem, full with olive trees, and in the middle of the field was some kind of olive press for making oil. The name Gethsemane comes from the Hebrew Gat Shemanim, or oil press in English. Millions of pilgrims visit the site each year, which is across the valley from the old city walls and Temple Mount. Recently, the custodians of the site began building a visitor's center and tunnel, linking the church grounds with the Kidron Valley across the street. When they discovered ancient ruins, the Israel Antiquities Authority stepped in to excavate and discovered a much older site. Suddenly, in the middle of this underground passage, the mountain collapsed and revealed ancient and amazing find, the Jewish ritual bath known by the name the Mikveh. Archaeologist Amit Ra'am explains the connection to the olives. According to the Jewish law, when you are doing olive oil, you need to be purified. For the first time, we have archaeological evidence that something was here in the Second Temple period, the days of Jesus. The findings are set to be incorporated into the new visitor center. Up till today, pilgrims like to come to this place in thousands every day. We hope to preserve the element. We are excited to be able here in Gethsemane to find uh, something which belongs to the time of Jesus. Archaeologists also uncovered the remains of a 1,500-year-old church in the Kidron Valley. Later, a large hospice or monastery was built on the site, but it was destroyed in the 12th century probably as a result of Salah Adin's Muslim conquest of the city. Ra'em says the Gethsemane excavation is an example of Jerusalem's archaeology at its best, combining traditions and beliefs with historical evidence. Julie Stahl, CBN News, at the foot of the Mount of Olives, Jerusalem. Still ahead, a young family from Belarus gets crucial help from CBN as they make a new life in Israel. Jewish people returning to Israel is prophecy fulfilled, and for many, a dream come true. CBN stepped in to help one couple make Israel their home. Alex and Diane are a young Jewish couple who immigrated to Israel from Belarus. 
They told me it was their dream to come to the Promised Land to build a better life for their two children. We felt a calling for many years to make our home in Israel, and I believed that it would be the best place for our family. Belarus is very low income and there aren't many opportunities. I wanted my children to have the best chance at life and I knew Israel held that for them, but still we have struggled. Alex expected to find a job right away in Israel, but weeks passed and the family's savings dwindled. Soon they went into debt just buying food. It got to the point where we didn't have anything we were in crisis. I felt like I failed my family, and it was horrible. It was very difficult for my husband because I knew he was doing everything he could to take care of us. We never owed money before, and we never had to ask for help. We had no idea what to do. Then Diane met someone who told her about CBN Israel. We started giving the family food and diapers. We also taught them how to manage their finances in Israel. We gave them some money to get them out of debt and even helped them find furniture for their apartment through a local ministry partner. We couldn't believe it that you would just give this support and expect nothing in return. You made sure my children had food to eat. Thanks to CBN Israel, the family got through that difficult transition. Now Alex works full time installing drywall and is supporting his family. It means so much to know that you wanted to help us. Thank you for this. You have given us a great start, and now we have a bright future in Israel. The situation we were in had nearly squeezed the life out of us, but you gave us air to breathe again. Now we want to help others, just as you have helped us. Thank you. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And you can also access CBN content through our CBN News and other CBN apps. And don't forget to sign up for our email blast so you can continue to receive all of our exciting CBN content. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.